I speak to you this morning in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I've mentioned before to you all that I grew up in St. Louis, but one of the uh, very unique, maybe even singular experiences that I grew up with was a, an air, an environment, a context of ecumenicism that is unlike anything that I have experienced since. My father, I think I've mentioned before, was doing Ph.D. work when I grew up in, in theology. And he was doing it at a Jesuit institution, so there was this significant kind of Roman Catholic influence while we attended a Baptist church. But then, even within my Baptist church, the pastor I grew up with had done Ph.D. work himself on liberation theology, which is a uh, Roman Catholic tradition that came out of Central and South America. And then he not only would do that, or not only did that, but he had orthodox icons in his office. He would go on retreats with Richard Rohr and with orthodox monks out in Arizona. And there was a sense in which we were all part of one larger whole. There was a real, true, and physical, and material sense of the unity and universalism of the church. However, after I graduated high school, went off to college, I was very quickly disabused of that notion, and I discovered how fractured the church often is, and the ways in which we get into our little boxes and become so convinced of our own rightness and righteousness. And then, several years later, right after Julie and I started dating, we found the Episcopal Church and became rather quickly involved, <laughs> excuse me, rather quickly involved. And then, shortly after that, I was invited by our priest to participate in the youth confirmation class that was coming up. So I was helping out with that youth confirmation class, and one of the things we did was visit a couple of different Christian churches to get a sense of what other Christian denominations were like and how they worshipped and what their ethos was. And one of the comments that my priest at the time, her name was Mother Terry, made, and it's something that's always stuck with me. As she said, as we talked with these youth, as they pointed out the differences and their ways in which they connected or didn't connect, often didn't connect with these other Christian denominations, Mother Terry said, you know, though, whenever someone is brought to Christ, transformed, renewed by the experience of the church, Whenever they find new life, whatever problems that church has, whatever difficulties they may have from our perspective with their theology, there must be something about them that is part of the universal church. There must be some kernel of the truth of the universal church and what they are doing if they are helping people to grow closer to God. And I've always remembered that because I think it's a humbling, it's a humbling observation for us. However much we think we have things right, we need to always remember that the church is larger than just our corner of it, larger than just our little expression of the church. And so often, so often the boxes that we can get into, the lines we can draw, the demarcations that we can set before us can get challenged, disrupted, overturned by our observation of the spirit at work in other places and amongst other people. And I want to bring that up today because that thematically connects with the sermons I preached the last several Sundays. Also, it thematically connects with where we're going programmatically in our forum offerings this year. But it connects, too, with both our epistle reading and our gospel reading for today's Sunday. In our reading from Philippians, we have a very interesting juxtaposition that you miss if you don't pay attention to how the reading is formatted. Now, in truth, and this is no fault of anyone's, the way we often format the readings in the bulletin is structured in a way that makes the words flow and kind of fits with the pages. But if you were to go to your Bible 
and go to Philippians chapter 2, you would see that verse 6 through verse 11 are offset. They're kind of bracketed into their own uh, position on the page. And it's because scholars believe what Paul is doing here is quoting a hymn. So beginning with that phrase, who, though he was in the form of God, all the way down to the end, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, we believe that that whole section is actually one of the earliest hymns of the earliest church. And so Paul is quoting something that is being sung and recited by the community of faithful. And he's telling them, hey, remember, this is what we say in worship. So this is what we believe and profess to believe as a community of faith about who Jesus was. However, the interesting juxtaposition there is that if we flip to verse 11, we then hear, in, or sorry, verse 12, and then verse 13, we hear Paul say to the community, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so there's a sense in which the church is both a corporate experience and an individual experience. And as much as we have these phrases, these words, these liturgical elements that we all say in common, we're not going to experience those all in the same way. We're not all going to believe those words in the same way. We may all profess the truth of them, but what that means to profess the truth of them may have a different character for each of us as we come from different contexts, as we have different life experiences, as we are shaped, formed, and transformed by them in different and unique ways. So the church, in a sense, is both this corporate experience. It's important to have these words in common, the things that bring us together, that unify us, and show the oneness of who we are, while at the very same time recognizing when we say those words, when we affirm the things of unity, that each of us have a place, a particular location from which we are saying those words, from which we are affirming that unity. And we might each affirm that unity in a slightly different way because we have different life experiences and God has worked in us and through us in different and unique ways. And I think, in a sense, that is part of what Jesus is saying in the gospel passage. And it's not so much that Jesus is pointing to the fact that there are different ways of believing, but he's, he's cautioning against the prescripted way of saying, you have to act or you have to react or you have to believe in this very limited, rigid way or else you are outside of the faith. And what Jesus is pushing back against is a sense in which there can only be one way of experiencing Christ, experiencing God, experiencing the work of the Spirit in the world. And when we hear this parable of these two sons, we are invited again into this place of humility, a place very similar to where Mother Carrie was when she worked with this group of youth preparing for confirmation. The first son is for us that outsider, that one who has a different set of beliefs, who has some way of acting or believing or living in this world that we find objectionable. And that may be, in a somewhat concrete sense, the one who is outside of the church entirely, the one who is not doing the things that we think they should be doing as a good Christian. But it could also be the one who is participating, if we take this in a more figurative sense, in the church, participating in their faith, but in ways that we find objectionable. A tradition or a form of Christianity that just doesn't sit quite right with us. And yet, 
And yet, what Jesus is pointing to is that we cannot judge the heart of that other. It is not for us to know how that other is being led by God and led by the Spirit. And we are invited into a place of humility to step back, to listen, to observe, and to recognize the fruits of the Spirit, and to see those fruits of the Spirit wherever they may be, and to be open to the possibility that they may come from quite surprising quarters. But then the other side of this that we have to be cautioned against too, and I think this is especially a caution for us who are churchgoers, who find ourselves here every single Sunday, is that it is not sufficient to simply be here, to profess the words, to commit to the parts of the faith that we recite every Sunday, and then to leave from this place and not let it impact us, not let, us, let it transform us, not let it fundamentally shape who we are in this world. Because we can say yes all day long, and if we never actually follow through with that yes, what good is it doing us? So, when we profess these words, even though we recognize there's a contextual element to them, even though we recognize we may hear them in unique and different ways, it is important to remind ourselves that when we commit to our faith, that is a commitment that leads to action, that leads to transformation, that leads to a different way of living in this world. And part of living in the world differently then is having that humility to see the ways that others may live and to appreciate and be cognizant of the fact that Christ may be well and alive and active in places that we least expect. And to be surprised and open to those new ways of experiencing God. And so as we gather together today, as we prepare to move into this journey of exploring the church, the reality of the church, who we are as a church in the world, and how the church is a diverse body, a multifaceted body, let us be reminded that that multifacetedness, that diversity, is something that we experience ourselves, that we see in the world around us, and that it, uh, that it is for us, with humble hearts and minds, to be open to the activity of the Spirit, to be shaped and formed by the Spirit, and to be ever more moved, in whatever ways we are, to lift up the work of God, to be transformed by the work of God, and to participate in the work of God, this day and always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.